Hello. Hope and pray you're having a wonderful day. Uh, we are continuing looking at Jesus in uh, the Gospel of John and how we can live for Jesus. Jesus didn't just die on the cross so we could be saved. He wants to live on the earth through us to bless the world around us through us and call the world around us to him through us, through our words, through our actions, you know, through all that we do, all that we think, and uh, be the body of Christ. Christ living in you is the hope of glory. And so we've been looking at living for Jesus, and we've been in John here for a while, John 8, and then now John 9. We made it up to John 9, verse 16. Basically, a man born blind, not because of his sin, not because of his parents' sin, but so that the glory of God could happen in his life, uh, was healed by Jesus, but he was healed on a Sabbath day. And the Pharisees thought that it was sinful to heal on the Sabbath day. Even though God was the one who did the healing, God didn't make a mistake, say, oh no, I forgot it was Saturday. No, God wanted this man healed, and so he healed him on the Sabbath day through Christ. And uh, they missed the point. So they brought him in and are questioning him. And uh, we got down to verse 16. So we're probably going to read verse 16 again so we get started to it today. But let's remember, we don't want to have religious rules that we think are God's rules. That we use our religious perspective to keep people in or out of the kingdom we want them to be in. You're not the judge. I'm not the judge. Christ is going to be the judge. He came the first time as the Savior. He's coming back as the judge. But until then, we want to live for him. And let's see if we can learn something in John 9, not just from the man who's been healed, who used to be blind, but from the people who oppose him and who are remiss in supporting him. But we'll get to them in a little bit. But let's start by praying to God, all right? Dearest, loving Heavenly Father, we need you every hour, every minute, every moment. We need you. Father, help us live for you. Give us the strength. Give us the understanding. Give us the perspective. Give us the boldness. Give us the open doors for the gospel. But help us to live for you in a way that honors your Son with everything we say, with everything we do. In his name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, like I said, we're in John 9. We've gotten down to verse 16, and they brought in the man who had been blind, who Jesus had spit and, and made mud and put it on his eyes and then told him to go down to the pool of Siloam. And they don't have the handicap accessible sidewalks, and they don't have the nice little white and red uh, sticks for them to carry, and they don't have guide dogs, and somehow he makes it down there. And when he washes his eyes, he can see. But when he can see, Jesus is nowhere near him. But he comes back up to the temple, and somebody, oh, could this be the guy? No, 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 couldn't be. He says, no, I'm the guy. And so they bring him in to the Pharisees and chief priests and say, all right, who healed you? How'd you get healed? And that's kind of the process we're in right now in verse 16. Okay, so it says, so the Pharisees again ask him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Okay, that's, uh, that's verse 15, and he left out the spit part, okay? Uh, but some of the Pharisees said, well, <clears throat> well, this man's not from God, for he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others said, well, how can a man who's a sinner do such signs? So there was a division among them. Some people said, only God could do that. And if... It happened, this guy has to be right with God. No, 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 he doesn't keep our rules because our rules are the right rules. Our Sabbath rules are God's Sabbath rules. No, they're not. See, they had Sabbath rules that would make your head spin. Okay, if, if your dentures were made out of wood, you couldn't wear dentures on the Sabbath because that'd be picking up sticks. Children couldn't walk on stilts on the Sabbath because that'd be picking up sticks. You couldn't swat at a fly on the Sabbath. You could wave at it, okay? You couldn't tie a knot on the Sabbath. It couldn't be untied with one hand. 
They had rules for everything. There were so many paces you were allowed to take on the Sabbath day, and you couldn't go farther than that. <clears throat> so they had nitpicky rules about everything on the Sabbath. And about a bunch of other things, but we're just talking Sabbath rules right here. Uh, but they thought their rules were God's rules. And we laugh at that. But do we think some of our rules are God's rules? Well, what our church, church Jesus is right. Do all 33,000 and some different religious groups, organizations in the United States with headquarters in the United States, are they all right? Nope. We could all be wrong, but we can't all be right. Only Jesus is right. The rest of us are all wrong. All right? So, verse 17. It says, uh, so they said, to the, again, to the blind man, what do you say about him? Since he opened your eyes, he said, He's prophet. <laughs> I would have loved to have seen the expression on these guys' faces when this guy said, oh, yeah, he's prophet. Well, what gives you the right? You know, we are the religious leaders. You're just some guy that was blind, and now you can see. Yeah. Name all the people that they knew in their lifetime who had been born blind and could see. This guy. Nobody else. It's never been heard of that someone born blind was healed. And giving a sight back until Jesus does this in John 9. And so they're standing in front of a very unique individual who has a right to say, the guy's a prophet. Because in the Old Testament, miracles happened. You know, when the widow of uh, Zarephath, when her son was raised from the dead, prophet did that. When the Shunammite woman, you know, her son was raised from the dead, prophet did that. Uh, when the guy they rolled down into the tomb of Elisha was raised from the dead, a prophet did that after he died, which is a good story. Okay, but I'm saying all these miracles were done by prophets. And so here's a guy who was born blind, and now he can see, he's, yeah, the guy's a prophet. He has reason to think the guy's a prophet. Now, he doesn't have any idea who it is, because when he got his sight back, he was nowhere near Jesus. So let's go on. Verse 18, next paragraph. So the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? I mean, it's impossible. If he was born blind, if he's never been able to see all these years, how can he see? The parents weren't there either. They know it's their son, and I love their answer. <clears throat> His parents answered, no, we know that this is our son, and we know that he was born blind. But as to how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. I mean, this is not a youth, this is a man. So he's at least 30, because they weren't considered men until they were 30. And so he's, for at least 30 years, this guy has been blind, couldn't see anything. Now he can see. He says, he's of age, ask him. Well, I would think they knew, because I think he talked to him about it. And from what comes later, we believe that, that they knew, because he had talked to him about it. But they really don't want to say anything just yet. Why? Let's read on. Okay, verse 22. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he's of age, ask him. Passing the buck. <laughs> they didn't want to be the ones who could get kicked out of the synagogue because they said something good about Jesus. If they said something good about Jesus, they could be ostracized. If you say something good about Jesus 
in contexts, at work, at school, in your neighborhood, at family reunions? Does it cost you? Would it make you ostracized? In some of those locations, yes. But Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 31 and 32, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. We need to confess we're Jesus followers. We think he's amazing, and we think we have every reason to be amazed, and we are. They didn't want to be put out of the synagogue. And they loved the praises of men more than the praise of God. So they said, he's of age, ask him. We're going to pass the buck on this one. We're going to let our boy deal with that. Here's their boy. They have had to take care of this boy all his life because he couldn't see. Now he can see. And as soon as he can see, uh, let him. Let him take care of it. <laughs> oh. Religious peer pressure is terrible. And a lot of the doctrines that we believe that separate us they're nowhere in the Bible because the teachings in the Bible unite us. The doctrines that divide us, those are slants that people other than the apostles, other than Jesus, other than the prophets, they came up with those perspectives. And so we get divided by those things. But Jesus prayed that would be one, that would be perfected in unity. Let's not think that our rules are God's rules. Ever. Okay. Verse 24. It says, So, for the second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. What an introduction. They've already brought him in before. He's already told them what happened. He was blind. He was born blind. He'd been blind his whole life. And now he can see. And he told him how it happened. And he told him the name of the guy that they said did it because he didn't see him because he was blind when it happened. But it's Jesus. Well, he's, he's got to be a sinner because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. No, he doesn't keep your rules of the Sabbath. God didn't make a mistake by healing this guy on Saturday. God knew what day it was. And it was God's power that got this guy healed. Nobody argues with that. If God expended that power on the Saturday, God thought it was okay to heal this guy on a Saturday. They didn't. They had rules. And their rules were God's rules. Don't make your rules God's rules. Amen? Let's continue. So they give glory to God. This guy's a sinner. I love I love this guy. I would I'd like to hug this man. Well, he answered, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, now I see. <laughs> Can't argue with that. If God decided to work through a man that was a sinner, whatever God did, I can see. And I couldn't see before this guy did what he did. So I got every reason to believe this pretty good fella because I can see. I couldn't see before. I can see. They can't argue with that. What do you do when you are just so sure that you're right and yet you cannot handle the message that the other side shares? Hopefully you repent. But if you're unwilling to repent, you know what you do? You attack the messenger. Look at the response. Verse 26. They said to him, what did he say to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I've already told you. And you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples? <laughs> I, I, I would have loved to see the expression on these guys' face when he says, hey, I already told you. Why are you asking me again? Do you want to become his disciples? 
they, oh, that would be an anathema, curse to them. Oh, no, we, we don't ever want to be this guy's disciples. Okay, but he said, hey, why do you want to hear it again? I mean, I already told you. I love this. The one who's in charge is God working through a formerly blind man. It's not the Pharisees. It's not the chief priests. They lose it. They lose it bad. Look at their response. He says, do you want to be his disciples? Great question. Verse 28. Well, they reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. Neener, neener. Moses is better. We're Moses' disciples. He's been around for 1,500 years. We like him. We've got it. He's got scripture. He's on our side. We're on his side. We made up all these rules based on his, his rules. Yeah, but they're your rules that you made up. Oh, well, let's go on. Verse 29. We know that God has spoken through Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he comes from. This guy could come from anywhere. Moses is one of God's people. I love this guy's response. He's not done. Okay, we don't know where he comes from. And uh, verse 30, the man answered, why, this is an amazing, and I love the, I, I would love to hear the expression that he said this with. He says, why, this is an amazing thing. You don't know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but if anyone's a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the creation of the world has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. The guy's got a really good argument. He says, God wouldn't honor a man who was rebelling against God. But he honored this guy with a miracle so amazing it's never, ever on earth, ever, anywhere happened before. A guy born blind, me, was raised from the dead. I'm not raised, was, was given sight. That can't happen. I know, but God did it. God's really good at the impossible. Still is, by the way. But the thought is here, he says, if God didn't listen to sinners, and he listened to this guy, then he's not a sinner. And this guy was used by God to do the one of the most amazing miracles that's ever, ever, ever happened. A man born blind can see. That's never happened before. He says, I'm number one. You know, I'm not one in a million. I'm one in everything. There's nobody like me because there's nobody like him. They can't argue with that. Again, what do you do if you don't want to repent, but the message that you're receiving is absolutely overwhelming? There's no way you can answer it. What do they do? Verse 34, they answered him, why you were born in utter sin and would you teach us? So they cast him out. They couldn't deal with the message, so they kicked out the messenger. I don't want to hear it anymore. Just get rid of this guy. The message is still there. One of my teachers was teaching this lady about God and she had a religious perspective that baptism wasn't necessary for salvation. Even though Jesus said, verily, verily, King James, amen, amen, in the Greek, I say unto you, unless a man is born of water and spirit, he shall no way enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. She, so the guy read this verse, he said, that's not in my Bible. He says, let me see your Bible. So he got a Bible. Sure enough, she had cut that out. And he went to Acts 2, and he cut that out. And he went to Romans 6, she'd cut that out. He went to Colossians 2, she'd cut that. Finally, he went to Luke 7, 29 and 30. 
that the uh, scribes and Pharisees rejected God's purpose, not having been baptized by John, but that the tax collectors and sinners accepted God's purpose, submitted to God's purpose, having been baptized by John. And so she said, let me go get my scissors. Okay. Just because you don't receive the word of God does not mean it's not the word of God. So he kicked him out thinking that they could cut that passage out of their Bible. It's the word of God. Jesus, if Jesus said it, it's true. What's John 12, 48? He that rejects me and receives not my words has one that judges him. The words that I have spoken, the same will judge him in the last day. Jesus gets to say that. Nobody else can say that because everybody else has a, somebody in their, in their box. Jesus was raised from the dead and ascended to heaven, never to die again. So they kicked him out. Why? They couldn't deal with his argument. You think Jesus is going to leave this guy out there? Let's read on. Starting in verse 35. Jesus heard that they'd cast him out. And having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Great question. See, the Son of Man, they weren't sure if it was the prophet or the Messiah. Uh, because they had taken all the prophecies about the Messiah and divided them up into the ones that talked about him ruling and reigning and blessing people and the ones that talked about him dying and suffering and, you know, being slain. And all the, all the suffering passages, those were the prophet. And all of the ruling and reigning and blessing people, that was the Messiah. They couldn't understand a suffering Messiah. But they knew the Son of Man was in there, one of the two. And so he says, do you believe in the Son of Man? Great question. For that time, it's the best way to ask it. Plus, he says, if you believe in the Messiah, his next answer could get him in trouble. But if he says Son of Man, that won't necessarily get him in trouble. So he says, do you believe in the Son of Man? Well, he answered, uh, who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Okay, the guy wants to believe in him. If you knew who the Son of Man was, would you believe in him? Would you want to believe in him? I like the response. Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and he is the one speaking with you. As soon as those words came out of his mouth, I can, I can see this man formerly blind just going, oh. I was formerly physically blind. Now I was formerly spiritually blind. Now I can see physically, and, and now after this verse, I can see spiritually. I'm standing in front of the Son of God, who is the, who's called the Son of Man. So he says, you have seen him, and he's the one who's speaking with you. And I just, I would, I, again, there's so many times you want to just see the expression on these people's faces. All right, so look at this passage until you can see the expression on his face. And then we'll go on. So, uh, uh, let's see. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Now, angels in the Old Testament don't receive worship from God. In the New Testament, angels don't, from man. Angels don't receive, they won't receive worship from, if they get, if men try to worship them, Angels tell them, stop. They know that they are not in the same class as God. But when this man gets down and worships Jesus, Jesus lets it happen because he's the son of God. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. In verse 14, the word dwelled among us. Okay. And we beheld his glory full of grace and truth. So he's, he's the one. And he accepts worship. So, Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. It's not meant to be tricky. 
It's meant to be very obviously true. The people who were blind but wanted to see God, they were the ones that came to God. As I mentioned earlier, the passage in Luke 7, verse 29 and 30, the tax gatherers, the sinners, they accepted the purpose of God. They were baptized by John, and they followed Jesus because John led them to Christ. John realized, I must, in, I must decrease and he must increase. And so he, he led people to Jesus. That was his task. And, and so they, they say, uh, the blind can now see. And those who see become blind. The religious leaders were so sure of themselves and they couldn't see it. They couldn't see it. The Sadducees had the first five books of your Bible memorized. All of Genesis, all of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They could quote all of them. Every verse, every word. That's a lot. What did Jesus say to him in John 5, 39? He says, you search the scriptures daily because you think that in them you have life. But these are the very words that testify of me. And they missed it. They missed it. They couldn't see it. They were blind. And Jesus says here, those who see become blind. Well, they'd already been blind, but that's another story. So let's go on. Now, let's what, see what their response is. Verse 40. So, uh, some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and they said, are we also blind? Are you saying that we're blind? Huh? You saying we can't see? You say you're so holier than thou. You think you think you're better than us. You say that we can't see. You saying we're blind? We've been to rabbinic schools. We've learned all this stuff. We know all these scriptures. What do you mean saying we're blind? I love. Je I would not have thought of this answer, but Jesus did. And in verse forty-one, Jesus answered and said to them, "If you were blind, then you'd have no guilt." But now you say, we see, therefore your guilt remains. The innocent are innocent. Little children don't willfully sin against God. Some people with mental deficiencies never sin against God. Their hearts are still just pure before God. And because they never willfully have sinned against God. And, and so uh, here he says, though, you say, we see. You say, oh, we understand this stuff. Well, we know all this spiritual stuff. We've got all the answers. He says, therefore, your sin remains. See, when you lift yourself up, it never works. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Why? James 4, 6, and 7. For it's written, he gives a greater grace. For it's written, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. They were unwilling to submit to God because they were right. And they were righter than Jesus, they thought. And righter than this man who had been born blind but now could see. No one had ever done a miracle like what they witnessed and they couldn't even give glory to God. They had a loyalty to, not just to Moses, they had a loyalty to their perspective of Moses that was stronger than their loyalty to God. Please, please, don't ever hold a loyalty to any denominational doctrine or structure or organization that separates you off from people who don't hold that same loyalty. Okay, in math class in third grade, three-fourths was a fraction and three was the numerator and four was the denominator because with the denominator, it divides stuff. Guess what denominations do? They divide us. I don't want to be divided. I want to be your brother. If you're born in Christ and I'm born in Christ, I want us to be brothers and sisters. Okay? I heard a wise old preacher say, you can't unbrother what God has brothered. And what that lacks grammatically, it more than makes up for theologically. 
Don't let loyalty to a teaching divide you like these men did. They were blind, but they thought they could see. We'll start there next week in chapter 10. God bless you.